I will present to you an efficient and economical approach to front-end testing. So the presentation is going to be divided in six different parts. First, I will give you an introduction as to why do we test. Then I will explain to you the benefits and also the costs of testing. Once those two things are clear, we can move up to how can we maximize the benefits while minimizing the costs of our tests. At last, I will give you some extra tips about how to write better front-end tests, and then we'll close with a conclusion. So I would like to start my presentation with an introductory example. This is an excerpt from the book Clean Architecture by Robert C. Martin. Um, this was taken from a case study done inside of a company which did not introduce test-driven development practices in their software development cycle. Um, as you can see here, the red line represents the costs of each line of code written and you can see that that, that line goes up over time. Um, the x-axis, those numbers there, are the release numbers of the application. And the green line represents the productivity of the development team over time as compared with the productivity during the first sprint. So as you can see here, there is a small problem with this graph, and is that the productivity is not going up as the costs per line of code go up. If you see a graph like this, you would actually expect that the more, the more you invest into your development team, usually by hiring new developers, for example, you would expect the productivity to also be higher than before. But inside of this company, exactly the opposite happened. The costs were up and productivity went down. And this is because this company basically did not write tests. Among those tests, front-end tests, and, um, well, this means they missed out some of the important benefits of testing, which are three. Well, there are actually many more than just three, but here I only wrote the first three that I consider to be the most important ones. So, first of all, tests guarantee that our application works properly. I think this is a bit obvious, but it's worth mentioning. Um, the only way how, how you can guarantee that your software works properly is by writing a test which proves that it does. Then tests can help speed up the development process. This is in medium to long term. I know that that's a, that's a point I might hear some objections towards, but um, in the long run, writing tests minimize the amount of bugs that happen inside of your application, and therefore they speed up the development process in the long run. And at last, they are also a form of documentation. This means new developers that arrive to your company um, when they are learning the architecture of the app, they can actually go through your tests and then understand what the functionality of each tested module is. This is very important because it helps new developers be productive for the application much faster. At last, down here, I wrote a small disclaimer disclaimer, which is that testing can only show the presence of defects, but not, but not their absence. This means if your application is 
fully tested, it does not mean that, that your application does not have bugs or that it does not has, have problems, but that it um, but that it doesn't have defects that are being covered by the tests. So now knowing about these three main benefits, we can take another look at the graph that I showed you at the beginning. And here we can see that there is a new green line up here. That should have been the, pro the productivity of this company throughout time. This is the goal that we aim for when we write tests. Like that's, that's one of the end goals. Try to be as productive as you can be over long stretches of time. And this is what tests precisely help us do. Um, I am not saying that writing tests does not have costs. Like tests do have costs. And, and I identified three main costs that they might have, which are, which are first of all, development costs. Companies have to pay some developer like us to write tests. And besides that, that there are also my, um, maintenance co um, costs. This incur because if, let's assume you developed one feature that after two months got changed. If you had a test that was testing that feature, then you also have to modify the test for it to keep on working afterwards. The last costs are the execution costs. Tests need time to run. If you have too many tests, the, the execution costs can be very high, and this might lead to developers not executing your tests because they take too long to run. Nobody wants to wait two hours just to see the tests of your system run. So um, now I would like to give you a short introduction into how do we classify tests. And I will show you first how do we classify tests depending on their scope and then depending on whether we at first assume that the application will work properly or not. I will illustrate this first with um, the testing pyramid. This is probably a diagram that you have seen somewhere else. Um, well, let's start down here. Like, what is this? This is a diagram which tells you how do we classify tests depending of the scope of what we are testing. At the bottom down here, we have unit tests. It, Unit tests are very cool because they have the, fast, the fastest execution time, they are automatizable, and they are very simple to write. Usually, they should have the largest test coverage within your application. Um, in order to illustrate this with an example, I wrote a small script here, which is called Frontend <laughs> Madness Run Test comparison and right now I am going to execute all of the tests of um, of the backend service of the application that I am currently working on at fork on I will sh I will show it to you with more detail later so as you can see here these are PHP unit tests running inside of our backend container. So what is going on right now? The program is simply executing all the tests we have, which took it 24.24 seconds. And at the end, it, it ran 88 tests. So if we wanted to calculate how much each test takes to be executed, this is about 0.2 seconds, more or less. This is about a, a speed of um, five tests per second. So then these are unit tests. So above 
unit tests, we, uh, we have component tests, which are pretty similar to unit tests, but a bit larger. They, they are simply a test which, um, um, which tests the integration between many functions that should work together. So they are just as fast to run as unit tests. They are as cheap to write as well. And ideally, they should have a test coverage which is a bit smaller than the one of unit tests. Um, then if we move one more step towards the top, we have end-to-end -end tests. And this is the classification where front-end tests come to play. So end-to-end -end tests um, actually have a longer execution time than, than both component tests and also unit tests. And they are, all, they are also more complex. They are more likely to break because you have to bring the entire application to run in order to um, make the test work. This means something in the backend can go wrong, something in the front end might go wrong as well. In this case, in Forcon, the, the testing framework that we use in our application is actually Cypress. I am logging in into the front end now and I, I'm going to open the Cypress test runner here. Um, Cypress is basically a library for running front-end tests. And it is amazing because it does not only let you write unit tests and uh, front-end tests, but also component and unit tests at the same time. So these are all the tests that we have. And I am going to jump into the test that I prepared for this presentation, which opened on another screen. So. First, this is um, this is the test. Um, <clears throat> this is the view where you can observe the test being executed. On the right side of the screen, this is the application, and you can see how our tests constantly write and click stuff into the forms of our front end and make assertions about the output of what should come out after the test. For example, here we test whether a, a registered user can log in or not. And if I scroll down here, it can actually show me the state of the application in the front end when the test performed these steps. So this is a front-end test. And they can also be executed inside of the, of the command line. For example, I will close all of this and I will go back to my base directory. I will now run the same script as before, but now I will pass it the end-to-end -end flag. This will now run exactly the same test that I just showed you a few, a few moments ago, but it will run them within um, the console. I am doing this because this program will output the time that it took for this test to run at the end. Um, in order for you to have an idea of how much faster are unit tests in comparison to end-to-end -end test, we can do some simple math here. So we have here unit tests, uh, uh, front-end tests. They take 29.11 seconds to run. So here we can write 29.11, and now we can divide that by the amount of tests, which is, in this case, seven tests. So 29 divided by seven, this is 4.15. 4 this, this means each test takes about 4.15 seconds to run. So if you would want to run a thousand tests at this speed, you can then multiply this number by a thousand and you would come to about 4,000 seconds. If you would like to, to transform this into minutes, we divide it by 60, 
and then we land by 69 minutes. It would take us about an hour. But what would happen if we did this with unit tests? Unit tests take about the same amount of time. If I remember correctly, it was 24.11, no, it was 19.11 seconds. And in that time, we ran 88 tests. So if we do the math again, we basically get that in order to run a thousand unit tests, we only have to wait 3.6 minutes. This means to run the same amount of front-end tests, we have to wait for an hour. And to run a thousand tests as, as unit tests, it would only take us three minutes. If we calculate the ratio between these two numbers, it comes out that um, actually unit tests are about 16 to 15 times, well, in this case, 19 times faster than front-end tests. This is why here in the presentation, I wrote that these tests are actually more expensive than unit tests. The reason is because they are more likely to break and they also need more time to run. This is why they should also cover a lesser um, part of your application between 30 to 40 percent code coverage. At last, the most expensive types of tests there are are the ones that you cannot automatize, but those that have to be run by hand, which are in this case system tests. System tests are expensive because you have to pay someone to run them for you, and that takes a lot of time. So yeah, you can imagine well why you want to have a few of as few of these as you can. So this was how can you classify tests depending on the scope of what you are testing. Now um, there is another way how you can classify them, which is by what do you expect the application to do? This is very easy to grasp. There are positive test cases and there are also, and there are also negative test cases. Positive test cases assume that you will input valid data into the application and that the application will perform a valid action out of it. For example, the, the test where a user can, can log into our application that I showed you before, that's one positive test case. And the test where we assumed that the user was going to write a, a wrong email or, or a wrong password would then be classified as the negative test cases. So now that we are aware of the benefits and the costs and also of the classification of tests, now how can we maximize the benefits of testing while minimizing the costs? And for this, I devised an approach which has four very simple steps that anyone can follow, which are um, first, evaluate the importance of your tests. There are many different ways to do this. I, I, I will go deeper into all of these points later. The second step is to minimize the amount of your tests. If you have less tests, you have less work as well. The third one is to abstract your tests as much as you can. Make them reusable so that you don't have to rewrite the same test code all um, every time that you write a new test. And at last, minimize the execution time of your tests. So we'll dive into the first point now, which is evaluate the importance of the test. So if you are going to test a system as we front-end developers do, you do not test each component as if it was equally important. What you try to do is you ask yourself, uh -huh, how important is the component that I am going to test now? Is this really worth testing 
truly or only superficial? So the first question that we should ask is how important is the component we want to test? If it is important, we test it more. If it is not so important, we do not test it. The second point is how big are the consequences of a failure in this component? This goes more or less by hand with the first point. I think it's pretty obvious. Um, if your test, if a failure of this component would be catastrophic for the application, you should also test it more often and more and more truly than other components. Third, how often is this component used? Obviously, if, if you have a component that you used a lot, it should be tested more truly than a component that you only use once. Fourth, how dependent is the business logic of the app on this component? Is this a component that the, the user always has to do, um, has to use in order to move himself through your app? In this case, this is also an important component that you should test more. So having answered the first four questions, then you can decide whether your components should be tested completely, which here I refer to as you should write positive and, and also negative test cases for it, or if you should test it superficial, which are only a few positive test cases. So, so much for evaluating the importance of your tests. Now I want to move into minimize the amount of tests that you have. So if you illustrate this principle, I wrote this little Cypress test down here. And now I will ask a question to the audience. I think um, if you could answer through the chat for everyone, that would be amazing. Um, how many of these tests are necessary to check if two plus two is four? Here we have four cases. First, we expect that two plus two should be a number, then we assume, then we expect it to be an integer, and then we expect it to be greater than zero. And then at the end, we expect it to be four. All right, these are then four options. So which one of um, which ones of these four options can be removed from this test. Very well. I see several people already posted one to three. Yeah, exactly. That is the correct answer. These three first cases are are already included inside of the fourth option. Therefore, they, 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 are, they are irrelevant for this test. Now, how can we apply this very same principle to front-end testing? In software engineering books, this is usually depicted only to, um, to be used within the code itself, but it is never applied to front end. So I took the time to sketch a diagram. By the way, um, this method is known as equivalence class partitioning. I will explain to you in a moment why. So let's assume we have a, a login component and that we are testing. And this login component can have three different states. It can have a login successful state, which happens when you enter valid data into both fields. It can have an input fields are empty state, and it can have an access denied state. So, the, so let's just focus for now on this login successful state. So how many possible 
inputs can we enter into the user email form? Well, we could enter valid email A, valid email B, valid email C. There are a, a lot of different combinations that we could pick and it can sometimes become overwhelming the amount of, of possible options that we have. So what do we do here? We apply the very same principle as with the previous example. And we just pick one pair of inputs that we might enter in both fields. And we assume then that this pair of, of inputs down here, which is called a representative, will then represent all the possible valid inputs that there are. So since valid email also works for valid email A, valid email B, valid email C, instead of writing a, a test where you go through A, B, C, D, and, and all of those unnecessary cases, you only pick up one representative of that class and you write your test with a single representant. And then we do the same for, uh, for the other two states. Um, if you want to go a bit, a bit deeper into the theory, um, the, I, I don't want to talk <laughs> much more about this now, but um, in the books, this is, this is described like the possible inputs that we might enter into the system. They are inputs that are inside of an equivalence class. And this is the class where, where, where valid email A, valid email B, and valid email C are written, but we do not care about those. We only care about the valid email in this case. And therefore, we defined a single representative of that class, which is going to then re represent all the other inputs of that equivalence class. So then you do the same for the other two states. And at the end, you have minimized the amount of test cases that you had at the beginning. So, so much for this technique known as equivalence class partitioning. I am now going to move into the third point, which is abstracting your tests as much as possible. So I have seen many tests written where programmers basically copy and paste the same code over and over again in their tests. And well, there are a few problems with this. First, if you do that, your code is very difficult to maintain and you are not abstracting it to make it reusable for other tests. So my advice to you front-end developers is to first refactor your test code into functions. For example, if you have a component that you have to test regularly in your tests, then you can abstract that test into a function. And in that way, you can reuse that function inside of, of other tests. This is amazing because then you can end up writing your own testing library for your application. This also minimizes the development costs and also the maintenance co costs of the app because your code is at the end cleaner and also easier to maintain. Um, so the the third point is to treat your test code as if it was production code. What do I mean by this? When you write production code in the front end, for example, you try to make your code as, as modular, as readable, and as easy to understand as possible. Well, I invite you to do, to do the same with the, with the code of your tests because in this way, they will be much easier to maintain than if you don't. Um, what I just said can be summarized into the um, software engineering principles tr 
try, which stands for don't repeat yourself, and kiss, which is keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> so at last, the fourth point of my method is to minimize your test's execution time. So first, what you want to do is you want to eliminate um, repetitive manual procedures that exist within your front-end test. For example, if you always have to log in into the app, do not log in by clicking and then typing ma um, ma manually into your application. It is much better to, for, for example, write an automatic logging route for your app such that the test can log in faster. So the second point of advice is to run your test inside of of the CI. If anyone of you is not familiar with the concept of CI, CI stands for Continuous Integration. It is a set of software engineering practices which are which have a central focus to constantly test the software which is being integrated into your code base. So basically you set up a server somewhere and then every time that you do a, a git push in your app then the code that you push is is going to run through some tests inside of that server so um the third point is is to um then the server that you will use to run tests in the ci you can upgrade it and you can turn it into a very fast and very powerful server. I, I highly advise you to use a server which has a lot of RAM and also a lot of CPU in, in order to minimize the runtime of your tests. And if one server was not enough, then you can always parallelize your tests across many different servers, which will have the runtime, which is which each new machine that you add to the pipeline. The fifth point is don't make unnecessary assertions. This might seem obvious, but um, many programmers like to write excessive assertions inside of their tests and this doesn't do anything but making the test run slower. So I highly advise you to only run assertions in moments when you want to compare values or when or if you want to um, test the the um, if you want to guarantee that the test you are Writing depends on that assertion. So the sixth and last point is divide your test into subgroups and then execute them only when you need them. This is interesting because assume you have a thousand tests and you want to run them every time that you do a git push. If you did this, you would have to wait for hours before your tests finish it up running. And this is um, bad because then your your software engineers have to wait a long period of time before they can see the results of the test. Ideally, you would only want to run a small subgroup of your test in the CI, which accounts for the most important parts of the uh, application. And then if you want to, you can run all your tests together before a a release to make sure that your application works properly. The principle behind this is very similar to the one of regression testing. So um, those were the four points so far. Um, now I am going to give you a few extra tips of mine about how to write 
more testable applications? Um, well, first, I highly advise you to write a, a testable application from the beginning. I think it is very easy to go into the fallacy of, yeah, we will introduce tests later at some point. And then when you realize you have a code base of 2 million lines and nobody is going to write tests for all of that. If you're using Cypress tests, I highly advise you to, to isolate your, your um, CSS selectors with um, data CI attributes that are hard coded in, into the HTML. This makes your tests much more maintainable. Then write your code to be testable. This is not something obvious because um, when you write tests, um, uh, when you write code knowing that you are not going to test it, you write it in a different way. You do not write it to be testable. And if you do that, then when you want to actually write the test, you do not only have to write the code for the test, you have to also modify or refactor the existing code in order to write the test. And this is something that you prevent if you start testing from the very beginning. Um, I also advise you to write acceptance tests. Acceptance tests are tests introduced by usually the product owner, which um, are basically tests that guarantee that the requirements of the uh, of the new feature that you are programming are, um, are covered and that guarantee that those requirements work as they should. I, well, um, at last, I also advise you to have at least 80% unit test coverage, 60% um, component test coverage, and 40% end-to-end test coverage. The next main point is to run your tests as often as you can. If you write a test and you do not execute it ever, that test was a complete waste of time. The reason is because the way how tests help us spot bugs is by running them and then seeing if they catch a bug. So if you never run them, you will never actually e extract value from the test. So the next tip is to minimize the discrepancies between your development, CI, and production environments. Um, this is very helpful because it helps decrease the amount of test failures caused by different environment variables across the development, CI, and production environments. I have heard many times, oh, look, a test, a test works in development, but when you go into production, it does not work. Ideally, you would want to test your application in, in the latest stage of development as you possibly can, because in that way, you can ensure that the test that you wrote in the development will also work in prod. At last, I advise you to introduce test-driven development practices. This is a huge topic that I, I do not have time to cover anymore. <laughs> but um, I advise you, developers, to learn the code test refactor loop, which is um, basically a, a different approach to programming almost when you write new code first, then you run the tests that you wrote to test that code, and then you refactor your code again until the test passes. And then once the test passes, you can then refactor the original code until it looks pretty, and then you move on with the next feature. I also 
recommend you to reserve a part of your sprint uh, capacity for testing. If you do not calculate testing inside of the of the capacity estimations of your company, it is very likely that developers will underestimate the time it takes to write good tests, and it is likely that they will leave this aside. Therefore, it is useful to always reserve a few story points for them within each feature. At last, um, a good um, tip is to do not deploy features to production that have not been tested yet. Because what you are doing, if you do that, is you are, you are deploying software from which you are not sure it works. I think this is a bad idea because th this means you are exposing your application to um, to make a bad impression on the people who use it. And I think if if you write tests, at least for the most important parts of it, especially front-end tests to see if the user can log himself in and out, for example, then you are sure that that works and you are sure that the users will not have problems performing those same actions later. Well, this is the last slide before we close. Um, my application is huge as ha and has no tests. What should I do? I think this has been the case by um, with most of the front-end developers that are here at least, oh, sorry, at least once. Um, I think it was also the case for us. Um, Dennis, when I arrived to Forcon, the, the, there were no tests, well, no front-end tests written. So I had to basically come up with a system which could help me test an application that was not written from the very beginning to be to be testable. So something that helped me a lot was to first estimate how much overhead it will take me to test the entire app. And here you do not only calculate the overhead of writing the test, you also calculate the overhead of having to refactor parts of the application to be to be compatible with your tests. And you can either do it all at once and take like like three months for it, or you can do it progressively. Then um, it also helped me to estimate which are the parts of the application that need tests more urgently. Idea, these are parts that are very often used by the user and that have a lot of dependent business logic on them. For example, login and, and also logout forms, etc. Um, another thing that we um, that I advise you to introduce are acceptance tests, as I just mentioned before, since they will also make your test code base grow over time. And if the app has no tests, meaning no unit and also no component tests, try to write end-to-end -end tests first. Why? In this case, end-to-end -end tests, in my opinion, have the highest value because they allow us to test interactions that the user would perform with our frontend. And since they test the entire integration of the app, if you have no unit and also no component test, they will at least give you the certainty that the user can interact safely with your application. Yeah, in this case, they have the highest ROI, which is return on investment. So this is my advice on what to do if the application has no, no test and, has, and was already written. And at last, the 
conclusion. I would like to make a small wrap up first, um, like during this presentation, what I showed you was a schema by which you can minimize the cost of your test while maximizing the benefits. I told you how to evaluate the importance of your tests, how to minimize the amount of, of tests that you have, and how to abstract your test as much as possible. At last, I told you to also minimize the execution time of your tests. So um, that was the approach. And now, before I close, I, I, will, I would like to explain to you why do I task test? I have already said test so many times that if I say task, it um, test comes out of my mouth. <laughs> Well, um, first of all, the reason why I take testing so seriously is because I um, I sometimes think about the amount of applications and the amount of maybe magnificent ideas that are out there that were never deployed to production because of bugs because of dirty code, because the company did not write tests to ensure that the beautiful idea that they had would also work as such when deployed in the real world. They could have been the next Google, they could have been the next Apple, the next Amazon. We do not know it. And it hurts me to think about that because it means, do you know how much value have I lost in my life because of those apps that were never deployed, that were never developed because they wrote no tests? In my case, it makes me a bit sad to think about it. I think that it is a responsibility, a moral responsibility for us software developers to ensure that the tests that the software that we write works properly and that <clears throat> sorry um and that the software that we write works properly and that we are not delivering software which we are unsure whether it works or not. I like to compare this with the example of a doctor who does not wash his hands before a surgery or a car manufacturer who sells cars to people without checking if, the, if their cars have brakes. Like if you put a product on the market and you want to make it as good as you possibly can, then you also want to test it. So for me, tests are a way of ensuring that what I build works. I am not asking you to think the way I do, but I am telling you that you also can. Thank you very much.